<laughs> Happy holidays, Merry Christmas, uh, whatever floats your boat. Um, welcome to the Sourcing Challenge Weekly. Uh, I'm here again this week with my good friend Dov. Um, today is the 30th of December 2020. Uh, we only have, what, one and a half days left of this uh, absolute uh, interesting year, let's just call it that. Well, what a year it has been, eh? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But what we wanted to do with this, uh, only the second episode of uh, Sourcing Challenge Weekly, is we wanted to go through uh, the last year. Uh, what was the, the ups and downs, but uh, to pick out things from pretty much every month, what we thought was interesting and um, that we wanted to share with you, either that you can go back and have a look at if you didn't see it already, uh, or just for us to talk to, uh, talk about what we thought about it and kind of what we got out of that from, yeah, the year that's almost over. Oh, yeah, let's go. <laughs> so the first thing we picked out was uh, an article by Maisha Cannon who, uh, for anybody who's followed the Social Challenge show, uh, would know that she's actually been on there. Of course, I'm going to link to the episode with her. Uh, Maisha Cannon is a pr prolific speaker at uh, both you know, source cons and other conferences. Uh, I know is a good friend of Jan Tix as well and had a big input to the first book uh, when Jan put out the first um, book that he put out. Uh, but Maisha is always good for well-researched articles and conference talks. So uh, the article she put out was 21 recruitment books to add to your shelf. Um, this was put out in January 2020. Yeah, there's a couple of things that could be updated. Uh, like one of the first ones on there is, uh, I think number three and number four is uh, Jan's books, um, the, which I have here. The blue, number one, and the yellow, number two, as you can see, well read. Um, that, of course, has been updated since uh, because Jan doesn't sleep. So uh, he thought it was a good idea to put out a 750 page uh, ultimate edition, uh, which is still missing 150 pages that you have to download when you buy the book. Um, but yeah, that's there. Uh, definitely can only agree with that. Uh, what's also there, uh, which I can only agree to as well, Katrina's book, uh, Robot Proof Recruiter. If you don't have these two book and you call yourself a recruiter, I don't know what you're doing. I mean, at least get the Kindle downloads um, and go through that. Uh, Jan is essentially the Bible for anything to do with sourcing. And the other half of the book is recruiting. Uh, if you're new or just like me, kind of looking for new things to kind of think about, or just you want to have things that you probably knew, but you forgot about. You know, this is the book to get. Uh, Katrina's book is exactly what it says. It's like, you know, you're one of those people that think we're going to be, uh, our job is going to be taken away by AI, uh, by her book, definitely. Katrina goes through the whole recruitment process and, and basically goes through all of the things that are there now, um, but also why you're not going to get replaced by AI, but what you need to do is make sure. And, and at the same time, uh, when it comes to Katrina, if you've seen any of her presentations in anywhere where she speaks, or even the show that she and Glenn were doing together, Be Human is the, the, the hashtag or the slogan that she goes for, so, uh, and that she's famous for uh, in, 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 the, in, our, in our community. So this is exactly what the book is about. It's about uh, you know, doing human things to, to, to humans. I remember when uh, it was uh, the meetup that you were organizing in Deliveroo's office, mm -hmm. that's what, two and a half years now ago. Uh, it was really hot and nobody came because it was so hot in London. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and Katrina set a very good example that imagine when uh, GDPR was introduced and everyone was getting messages, how many emails you received and how many of those you remember. And because normally every single message would trigger, oh my God, another, another email and you would just delete. And it's exactly the way we should approach people. So I love that uh, comparison. So uh, definitely I don't have books in front of me right now. I'm always <laughs> on the run, but uh, I have the paper one for uh, Katrina and uh, I read Jan's books uh, digitally because I need to um, highlight everything on the screen. Uh, for me, that's how, that's how my brain works. It's easier to, 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 to market, but definitely from all of the list, these two books stand out, not just because of their friends, but because they have really in-depth insights about the industry and about how, what to do differently as well. But I think, it, and it comes back to exactly that, both of us consider both Jan and Katrina friends. 
um, and it comes back to Katrina's Be Human. I, I'm, I don't know many industries and I follow a lot of different industries like online sales, online marketing, that kind of like where you can meet the people that you look up to like Katrina or like Jan or anybody that you, you, you've looked up to in the past. And when I started you know, sourcing the likes of, of Glenn Cathy and Glenn Gutmacher, you know, people that I like, I was buying Glenn Gutmacher's cheat sheets and things like that. And now like both of them is like, it's people that I talk to relatively regularly, uh, like, you know, on biweekly calls or interview them for my show. I don't know many industries where the barrier to entry to get to meet your heroes and learn from them, but also that they consider you somebody that they learn from. Like I remember sitting down with Glenn Gutmacher at a conference in the US and showing him some of the things that I do with scraping and telling him that it's like, look, you know, 10 years ago, I bought your teach sheets. And he's like, yeah, and today you're teaching me. Uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that is very specific about in our industry. And I have not seen that in many other industries. And you know what is beautiful, what you said about Glenn's example as well, that, that he was humble enough to admit it. And that's a very incredible place to be because, uh, you know, certain people, uh, they can be like big rock stars in our, you know, if, it, if it, that was a music world, they would be like, you know, rock stars traveling the world because that's how they, we see them because of the experience that they have and, and because of what they did and how many people they inspired, right? And, uh, but being humble and to actually understand that you don't know everything and then someone younger can actually bring something to the table and you need to be really be open in hearing that. So that's, that's exactly, and, and about both glands which you've mentioned, they're exactly that. Like exactly. when you, when you meet them in person, especially, uh, you know, it's, it's so crazy because this is not the image that you potentially can think. And but it's a like, lot of wow. those. It's like, you know, the people who, you know, a lot of the people who I remember going to the 10 year anniversary of SourceCon in the US and you had, you know, you had most of the people there that was at the original one, like Jim Stroud and Steve Levy and things like that. But like all of them are like, hold on, like these are people who are, you know, the original gangsters of sourcing. Um, and, you know, Amy Beth Quinn and things like that. People that are like, I've probably met like 10 times now in my life, but a lot of them I consider friends that I would be able to call if I had a question that I know that they're a subject matter expert on, which again is like, I don't know many industries where you're within a couple of, you know, within a year, a couple of years where you can get to a point where you are directly connected, like within, you know, a phone call to the experts in your field. Um, yeah. That is very specific. Like Dean De Costa is always, I think every time I hear Dean speak and somebody's saying it's like, what if I have questions or it's on a Facebook group and he's like, here's my number, you know, let's set up an hour. I have no problem spending an hour with you and I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through this. You know, you just have that where people are very generous with their time. And I think, like, I remember Jan, Jan takes this a good example. It's like, I remember when his book came out um, and I remember asking him to, to do the interview for the show. I've never met Jan until a year and a half ago uh, when we went to Seattle for SourceCon. It's the first time I actually met Jan in person. But we've talked before that. I interviewed him before that. You know, that's kind of things. Like, that's surprising because I, I, I was pretty sure that you've met in Europe. But it's the same with uh, Vanessa from South Africa. It's like I met her in Budapest. Mm. but we you know we've known each other online and that's a lot of the kind of people that you end up meeting is like oh you're that one that we've been speaking for the last three years online and then you know uh we meet each other Araf was another one Araf from Israel it's like yeah I've met him in my first also in I still never met him in person but like I interviewed him from my show and he's always there like he's always there in spirit at at, at Soso in Amsterdam even yeah. though he doesn't you know he ha I haven't met him there um, so yeah, that's the that kind of thing. It's like, and that, that's why I love going to in-person conferences is to meet those people. Um, but books is a good example. It's like, what I would love to from both Jan's books and Katrina's books, and I told them both that is like, I like reading, but not necessarily in the book. Uh, I, I'm an audio person when it comes to books, and what I'm missing from a lot of books that are written in our industry 
is that because a lot of it is, um, it's either self-published, like in Jan's case and Dean DeCosta's case, uh, or it's uh, Katrina has it through a publisher that doesn't like the audio. Uh, and it takes a lot of work to do an audio version of the book. But I'm like, I would so love, to, like I have no problem paying for both, but I would love to have an audio version of the book as well. And as well, imagine Katrina reading the content. Like that's the Katrina thing. Katrina is like, such an incredible. Like what, I love. Well, yeah, that. it's it's less about actually. So the format that I would love from Katrina, because I know that what Katrina has is all of those stories that didn't make it into the book. Because yeah. uh, some of the best, some of the best audio books that I love reading is the one where the author is reading the book but it's putting things in the audio version that didn't make it into the book. It's telling the story behind, but that wouldn't make sense to put in written form. And it's, it's saying, I'm going slightly off script now, things like that. And like, I know Katrina could do a very long audio book because of all the things that come behind what came into the, because the, Katrina's book is, not just Katrina, it, it's Katrina talking to 90 people around the world where she's like, I'm not an expert on everything recruitment, but I know people who are. So, you know, she came to, to a lot of us and said, look, I know you as somebody who's a subject matter expert yep. in this topic that I'm writing about right now. What, you know, what's your, what are you working on in that area? What's your ideas in those area? Can I quote you on that? And, you know, what, how can I find out more about that? So it's really well researched. Um, and it's no really problem. well researched. And you can see that in the beginning of as well. In the beginning of the book, she's very open about these are the people who helped me and like lots of places in the book as well. It's like, this is something I got from this person and that person yep. and they're the people to talk to. And, and like, and I love that. Uh, because that's the hardest piece about writing a book is like, who do I go to for research? Uh, because yeah. it's, it's hard to just do it all by yourself, which is uh, Jan has done a lot of it himself. But when he's, re when he's using other people's material, it's perfect that like a lot of it, he's like, this was Mark Chudovici helping me with this. This was Irina Shamova, things like that. Um, but a lot of what Jan has done is original research and, and him uh, but more and more kind of saying, like, look, I'm not the subject matter expert in everything. So these are things that somebody else has researched much more thoroughly than me. Yeah. And, and as another thing is that both of the books are priced at ridiculous amounts as well. And, and I think that it's important to mention that neither of them are profiting from it. They didn't create a book to make money out of it. No, I mean, Katrina doesn't Katrina's, make anything from it. Katrina's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, everything, all the royalties go to the charity, yeah. you know, so she's not earning anything from the book anymore. Uh, however, it's definitely the book. I would say that maybe if, if I would need to split, because for me, there's a difference, right? Katrina's book is more of an overall mindset. And yeah. if you're in recruitment or in HR, uh, whether Jan is more techy and it's more for sourcing. However, it's a perfect combination of both because, yeah. you know, still, uh, even for a sourcer, uh, when I was looking and reading uh, Katrina's book, I picked up a lot of useful information uh, because that is, she was talking to so many people. So uh, definitely, uh, definitely worth uh, trying out. And if you know any books that... Uh, maybe we didn't see on the list, but they were not mentioned. Do let us know. Uh, we might mention that in the future. Just drop us a comment uh, under the video or just send us a message and we'd love to hear from that. Definitely. And if you're one of those people in our industry that is writing a book, uh, let us know as well. I uh, would love to, uh, yeah, to mention that. As we said, this is going to be a weekly show. So there's going to be some weeks where if we just talk about one book and you know what, what's going to go on, that's going to be it. So, but yeah, uh, have a look at, um, at the Maisha's article. Uh, it was on text expander back in January. Uh, there's 21 books. Um, two of them were Jan's, which has now been replaced. Um, but there's also, um, there's also who, uh, which is a good book as well about mindset, about how to hire. I've worked for a lot of companies where the engineering managers are using that as a reference guide for how to look at hiring, um, there's Laszlo Bloch's book about, um, you know, hiring at Google. He was the chief HR officer at, at Google for 20 years, something like that, about how they think about hiring. 
uh, lots of things. So yeah, if you're missing things to to read in uh, in your holiday period or you know just things like that, this is a really good place to start. Uh, but yeah, as as, as Dov said, if there's um, books here that you think was missed out on the list, um, definitely let us know, uh, and we would love to talk about it in the future. February uh, was an interesting one for me. Um, so February was the two year anniversary of the first episode of the Sourcing Challenge Show. So the first episode with uh, Tris Bevel of the Sourcing Challenge Show came out in uh, February, 2018. Uh, I've had a couple of breaks in between that, um, but um, to kind of mark the anniversary and because I had some episodes that had been recorded, uh, but that I hadn't had time to actually release. I released the uh, episode with Glenn Cathy, which I was, I was really happy that I could actually get to interview Glenn Cathy. Uh, Glenn Cathy is, he's one of those, he talks about it in, in, in our episode uh, where he's like, he was at the second SourceCon, uh, but he's one of what I call old schools. Like he learned to source because that was the way that he had to, but he's one of those that says, he's not going to tell you about lots of tools to do. He's going to, tell you how to learn to do things the right way and why you do it. Uh, and a lot of what he's been writing on his blog, some of the things are 10 years old and people still think it's something new. Like we still hear conference talks with people who've been not so long in the industry where they just had a revelation of something that works. And I'm like, yeah, Glenn wrote about this 10, 12 years ago. Here's the article. This is, you know, this is much better research. Uh, and it's like, I, a lot of the people I've interviewed for the Sourcing Challenge show as well, it's like you asked them, like, where did you learn? It's like, well, I sat down with Glenn's blog and just went through all of it, uh, you know, one article at a time. And that's probably one of the best way to, like, if you're completely new to sourcing and that's all you have, definitely that, you know, that's what you should do because the level you're going to get to just by understanding what he's writing about you're going to be miles ahead of most sourcers because like it's well researched and it's based on Glenn's experience. And it's all about the mindset again. It's, you know, tools keep on changing, but the way we look at information and it's, uh, you know, I remember when he was, I was rewatching his um, uh, older video that he did at uh, LinkedIn, I think was a talent connect. Yeah, he's did a, I think he's done that three or four times. So, yeah, yeah. So yeah. there was one in particular. I mean, I was rewatching that over and over again. Not just for the sake that I needed some, you know, something in the background, but the way he presents information is just so um so clear and so simple that you know it's it's very easy. I I'm 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 amazing at turning simple things and explaining them in the most complicated way, right? But for example, Glenn, he is the most humble guy I've met. Absolutely. It's insane. I mean, uh, absolutely insane. And, you know, what I loved about, uh, you know, from, from, from your conversation with Glenn, that when he, when he started, um, you know, diving into sourcing, he started writing content for free that others were actually charging for. And, well... Uh, he even admitted that he got some phone calls of saying, hey, you know, you're ruining my business. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, which is now when we think about it, you know, it was a very different time. Now, you know, everyone is online and it's very easy to write. And that was, I think, even before Facebook and all the social networks. No, this was a blog. I mean, this was, yeah. you know, yeah, exactly. So, that was uh, so like you know, when... so now, like, we don't have these secret Facebook groups where people share content just in that group. It was... You know, uh, some people do take advantage of the information that they find and they try to monetize it. But I believe if you're not the one who created that in the first place, sorry. And then there is still um, a lot of content that should be given away for free. And I mean, there's no, there's no trade secrets. There's no zero day hacks in our industry. It's like everything we do, no matter what level of experience we have, is things that you could figure out yourself. Um, all of the training that we do or that we charge for is, like, nobody's going to tell me something that I couldn't have found out for free somewhere. The reason I'm paying three, 500 euros for training 
is to save two or three years of research because I'm going to yeah. get the information from somebody who's done it or who researched, who spent two years researching or who did the training or who has the experience and got the empirical research of whether what works. That's what I'm paying for. Uh, like when somebody is like, you know, why are you so expensive? It's like, you know, it's like, it's like well, you're not paying for my time. You're paying for 19 years of experience yeah. put into the time that I'm working on things for you. That's what you're paying for. Um, and, you know, people need to understand that. It's like I'm paying for training so I don't have to spend like there's things that I would love to spend a month or two months researching, but I don't have the time for it. But if I can pay for a course that's just going to give it to me on a silver platter, I will. Yeah. Uh, and that's what Glenn put a lot of that out for free because he had to learn. He learned by actually out of necessity, you know, as he said, like sourcing was very different when he started. And like he, he the only thing he had to do, like he had the company database in the company that he started in. That was his only source. So he had to find out how to do Boolean within that database. And he just got to be the best at that in his company. And by that got results. Um, and a lot of what he was working on was implied searches. It's like, well, rather than looking for specific keywords, I'm looking for, instead of looking for people who have a specific technology, I'm looking for people who used to work for companies that I know uses a specific technology. And that's how and one of his best stories is about exactly that. It's like a guy that he placed who had that exact specialism but it was mentioned nowhere on his profile and nowhere yeah. on his CV. But Glenn knew that he worked for a company that used that technology. So he implied that that was the truth. That's, yeah. that's the same 10 years later. It's like exactly it. If you're one of those recruiters to go to LinkedIn recruiter and you put in lots of keywords and whatever hits, you know, you're going to email them. Or you're the ones that make a list of companies that you know uses that technology and then look at people in those companies, whether it says that they have it or not, likelihood is they will. But the ones that don't mention it on their profile, they're going to get a lot less messages. Yeah. And, and uh, I think uh, one, one idea that uh, um, Glenn shared, and I think that was from one of those uh, Talent Connect videos, was about the similar thing. It's, you know, we tend to still, because we're in a rush, and especially that's more valid for recruiters because we don't have time at all. They only look at the first two pages of the results, but this is the algorithm feeding you information based on how detailed those profiles are. But it doesn't necessarily say that these are the right profiles. This is just ranked for you, but it's not the way it actually is. And I remember when Glenn was asking, so, you know, you run your, your bully and you run your search, you have... I don't know, 300 results. Um, how many results do you look at? And what do you do with the rest? And his suggestion was to, uh, to save all of them. And actually, if you don't have time to look into, that, uh, into those results on the day, uh, do that throughout the week. Yeah. And, but at the end of the day, look at all of those profiles. Because as you said as well, you know, people who have the, on the last page, they're the ones who are going to respond to you. No and one gets to them. Most of the time, they're the best ones. No, exactly that. Like, look, uh, if you have LinkedIn Recruiter, it's going to give you a thousand search results as a maximum. Yeah. Um, I use that a lot. And it's like, just because it gives me a thousand results doesn't mean that I can only see a thousand people. Like, I'm going to do a search that maybe give me 5,000 results, but I can still filter that from the size of the company that they're currently with. So guess what? Like, there's 10 different size of companies. Like, I can bunch those together and get a thousand results five times, it's still gonna give me all 5,000. And yeah, I've been known to look through all of those 5,000 because one, if I didn't, I would miss somebody. And two, especially if a new search, it's gonna tell me a lot about that industry. Yes, the type exactly. Of people by knowing, like I will look and I will look at what's the, like, what's the main company these people work for? What's the company they used to work for? If they're all working for this company, where did this company get their people from? Um, if I can see that there's five people who used to work for that company now working for another company, it's a startup, but it's like that startup is interesting to me. It's like, what, what happened to make all of those five people leave? And who else is working for that company? Where did they get people from? Those connections yep. is you're not going to get from just pure keywords. Like that's when you get into 
scraping search results, um, you know, VLOOKUPs, uh, you know, um, I do a lot of kind of, you know, okay, a lot of inferred searches and I want to see who the top company is or I don't want, you know, I don't want the top five. I want the next ones like the top 10 to 20. Um, those are the ones that are interesting and finding those correlations with five people leaving one of the big companies and starting their own. And then where do they, ha where do they headhunt people from? Because that's what I want to know or uh, what we do a lot in my current company as well. If we get a new client, we map out what their current team looks like. Where did they normally get? Where did they come from? from? Yeah. What schools did they go to? What yeah. companies did they come from? Uh, you know, because we know this, like they're probably looking for similar things, but also it's a good question to ask a manager. It's like, so I looked at your current team and it looks like you're all from this. What are you missing? It's like from a diversity point of view. And I'm not talking male, female, non-binary. I'm talking about what, diversity of thought are you missing in your because I can see you're all coming from the same school or you all studied the same like you don't have diversity in thinking what can I what can I like what can I do to help you to get that or half of your team is from the same company that they used to work for so let's not do any more of that and I like I have managers like that's a good point yes please don't you know I have a I have I had a potential customer a couple of weeks ago. It's like, we don't want anybody from that company because half of the team is already from there and mm, we're turning into mini that company. And that's the kind of thing. It's like, that's research that you get a lot of from just using the search result and looking at connections in that. And, you know, and just to, to add to that as well. So, uh, you know, this year I, was, I wasn't really sourcing as much because I just did it really part-time uh, but I, I was looking for, let's say, UX designers in Germany, which was a very new field. I've never, I've never looked for that before. So, uh, and this is as well something that I would credit Glenn for, uh, that um, at the beginning, my strategy is running on a very wide search. Uh, and then, as you said as well, it, uh, you know, you you know, taking the, the title of the, even, even if it's at the title of the, of the role and then just running it as widely as I can. By that, I'm identifying companies and I would be making, uh, you know, an air table with all of the, I, I'm building my own database. So um, as you said, like looking into who, uh, who like into the current company, where they came from, and then mapping everything out because then you can actually try to identify those things. And another thing is that maybe what you didn't mention, I would look into the interest mm -hmm. because the interest can show me the groups and the companies that they follow. And if someone is really in the field, they will, you know, it's, it's visible all the companies that potentially are in the same field that I haven't even thought about. Yeah. So uh, by that you're, yes, it takes longer but you're building this database of information that you will be able to use for another project as well. And it's why sourcing is a research discipline. It's like, it's not just about us getting candidates. It's yeah, that's the, that's the result at the end of the day. But for us to get there, it takes a lot of research, like 90% of the time for us is used on the research part to build up that subject matter expert in the different disciplines that we source for. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's what we use a lot of time for. And then it's about, you know, depending on what kind of discipline of sourcing you're in, uh, whether you do outreach as well. But it's, again, your outreach strategy is going to be much stronger if you've done the research in the industry and that you understand the connections. Yeah. Um, also in February, uh, our dear friend and... Uh, Sourcing Challenge co-founder Aaron Linz uh, wrote a brilliant article on um, SourceCon about LinkedIn Recruiter spreadsheet hack. Um, so if you have not seen that, I'm going to link that to that here. Uh, it, it goes back to Aaron is one of those prolific sourcers that question everything. Uh, Aaron is not just a good friend. Again, uh, I learned a lot. Aaron was one of the people that I met very early in my quote unquote sourcing career because uh, I was lucky enough to get to work with him. Um, so a lot of kind of what I do and what I learn in terms of scraping and, and using different sources is from, from that, uh, from what the kind of Aaron, and, and Aaron is a self-taught sourcer as well, uh, where he just questions things and it's like, okay, I have this tool, how do I break it? 
you know, what's behind the, what's behind it? Like, how can I get into the code? So he's done a lot of research on API calls, you know, things that are things that you don't see, but it's in the code. It's in your browser, but it's not necessarily in the UI that you see. Um, and also, how do you kind of connect in things that your company pays for, like LinkedIn Recruiter, and connect that with different things that you can get more, uh, more out of. So, um, yeah, he put an article about uh, a spreadsheet that he did uh, for LinkedIn Recruiter and how to use the most of that. Which yeah, is absolutely and, and brilliant. For those, and for those who are not aware of, of the amount of information that Aaron is always sharing, I mean, you seriously need to follow him because for me, he was one of the people that I've learned the most from. And I remember when he, when he, when you guys did the, the training, I was watching and I was just trying to understand <laughs> like how to scrape meetups and Slack groups. It was before anyone else was talking about it. Now everyone is talking about it, you know? But, but even, even then, like Aaron, because he, he, he'd been speaking about this for two years. And it's why I, I was after him, because he spoke about it both at Sosu in Amsterdam and at SourceCon in the U.S., um, and it's like, you know, having a half an hour talk from Aaron is like standing like in front of a machine gun. You're like, there's so much information and it goes way over your head. But you're like, I want to be able to do that, which was what like yeah. I, I pushed Aaron to make a course out of it. And you were, yeah, you were the first one to sign up for the course. Uh, and I mean, I, I, I couldn't, I, th that's the thing. It was, you know, it was an opportunity and I couldn't, and I was so surprised that, you know, that not that many people at the beginning went for it because I was like, it's this still, is still even that, but it's like even now. And I think it's one of the things that I'm kind of thinking about, like what's missing on that course? Because it's like that still, I think it's an eight hour course. Um, or, but it's like it's full on in from like Aaron walking step by step, like scraping meet up. Um, scraping Slack, but it's it's about going in and doing all of these conference apps that we all use, like Whova and you know uh, whatever whatever conference like when we still used to do conferences in in person. Um, but even now with another the online conferences, that uh, those attendee lists they're not going to be in Excel form somewhere like they used to be because nobody leaks those, but they're still there because what most of these apps are are just skins over a web app that links to some bucket in Amazon Web Services that is not locked down. And what Aaron did is find ways to actually get that information in readable form so that you can get the attendee list from a conference, you know, from last month or last year that you never went to, I, to the point of like he, he got, you know, the attendee list from a cybersecurity conference. That makes no sense but they use an app that is horribly open. So 1,500 people who went to one of the major cybersecurity conferences, uh, you know, things like that. How ironic is that? I mean, it, it is, and it's, it's like, but, and that's publicly available data if yeah. you know where to look, uh, because they might, you know, there's a password and it's locked down, but it's like, it's actually just an API call to. A I mean, finding finding a password for Hoover event that's the easiest thing. It's like no, takes ninety seconds. Exactly, if you know what to do. So yeah, yeah uh, like I, we Aaron sat down and actually made a step by step course for that. But even with that, it's still with all of that video content. It's like, like I was. It was pure egoistic for me. It's like I was recording and editing that course for Aaron because I wanted to learn and I still have an, I, I, I have an iPhone, but I have an Android phone just so I'm able to do the steps that Aaron did. Uh, and I love doing that. But what I think the next step for that is that actually to, to have a, a step by where you spend like 10 days with somebody like me, it's like, okay, let's just go one step at a time, all of us together. And like, what do you actually do? So that turn Aaron's course into a much longer course, but with the same content, but just kind of go through. Uh, mm. because it is, it's a brilliant, which is also why we priced it for what we did. It's still, it's 500 euros uh, for a reason, because it's like, there's basic training, there's advanced training, and then there's Aaron. And the reason that very few Exactly, people, because this is, this is expert. not, an, it's like, this is not easy, like this is not for everyone. And that's, yeah. that's the thing. It's, um, it's, you have to be, like, I was certain 
there were certain steps that I was rewatching over and over and over again because I was just trying to understand if something was not working for me. And you know, when you're doing it live, you're like, oh my God, like how? And then you're just like, Aah! and you still want to do it. So it's, 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 in, it's, I need to revisit. I have even no idea how to, where is the access to that anymore? Oh, but no, no. I, yeah, you still I have that. It's, it's still on. Well, now we, we changed the domain. So what used to be the, it, it's on sourcing skills and you still have access to that. Um, okay. And yeah, if any, anybody wants to know about that, uh, sourcingskills.com, where uh, the upcoming training from uh, Aaron and I and the Lokenbergs for February uh, is being sold there. And you also have the, the conference app sourcing uh, training from Aaron Lintz uh, from last year, two years ago, uh, is being sold there as well. Uh, definitely, if you're at a point where you're like, ah, you're like I've, I've done the training, I need something new. Mm-hmm. That is definitely, you know, if, if, you, if you think you run out of places to look for candidates, uh, welcome to the world of conference apps, because that is extreme level of details that you can get and i'm not talking about who are the speakers at this at you know conference it's like who are the attendees at this conference because guess what like imagine you know you contacting somebody who went to a specific programming language conference you know last month or a year ago uh that's a completely level of like it doesn't matter whether it say says on any of their profiles that they do that language if they went out of their way to get their company or pay themselves to go to a conference about that topic, then like they're interested in that topic. And you know that they were there because they were on the attendee list. That's a completely level of a like, different level. And it's publicly available data, but not everybody knows how to access it. Um, so yeah, definitely it's worth the investment um, to go through that course. Um, there is a f- private Facebook community just for the people. And Aaron is very good at if you have a specific like app or a specific problem it's like how do i you know how do i get attendee lists here aaron is on there and it's like okay this is what he's, I gonna, do. he's gonna do a video that's for yeah, sure. exactly he'll make yeah. a video and it's like this is how i did it and you just have and use this tool and it's you know that and i love aaron for that because that's what he always does um he, yeah. he always spends the time with you going through things like that because what he does is miles ahead of, of anybody else it's like to get to advanced training with Aaron, you have to take him down a couple of notches um, because most of what he does is at a level that is expert. Like you really, you need to understand most things within the sourcing community to get to understand what he's doing. And like, he's not a developer, yeah. like, like, you know, Andrew you know it kind of, it kind of reminds me of Andre Bradshaw and coding with him. <laughs> but he's, he's a developer, like he's a self-taught yeah. developer and you, you still need to get into that development mindset where he's good yeah. at explaining it. Aaron is not a developer. He's, he's, and he says so as well. Like he understands enough to pick things apart, but he wouldn't be able to, program his own things so what he's looking for is he's looking he's good at understanding connections he's good at looking at things and saying it's like you know what what's the connection here it's like what looks different it's like where's this gonna lead me uh, and yeah he just likes going down rabbit holes and finding out oh, what's yeah. at the end of them and this is how sourcing works we do end up going down the rabbit holes anyway so exactly so yeah, that was, uh, well, that was February as well. Uh, March, well, April, May, uh, I bunched that kind of together. Uh, amazing hiring tech sourcing course. Uh, if you were one of the 6,000 people globally that signed up for that, uh, either uh, watched it live, watched the replays, or watched the course that we made out of it afterwards, uh, you would have seen uh, how many of us was there. It's like, 10 different trainers, uh, five, was it five weeks? I think we were five weeks of training twice a week. There was a source con at the end and there was an exam as a certification at the end as well. Um, it was a brilliant event. Like the Lokenbergs were there. Uh, I was there. Balash was there. We had- Joanne Lockwood was there, I think. Joanne well. Lockwood was yeah. there because I am not going anywhere near, uh, you know, talking about diversity, but Joanne had a, brilliant session again about the mindset less about you know how do you look for this and that and more about what is the mindset because it's like diversity is nothing if you don't have inclusion Uh, and she was very specific about that 
Uh, we had a follow-up Q and A a couple of days later, uh, where I got uh, Sarah Goldberg on as well, kind of because then you had the other piece of it on. You know, uh, Sarah is for me one of the experts in diversity sourcing of how technically to do it, but at the same time, is very it like is very dialed in about again inclusion means everything because there's no point of sourcing for diversity if the environment you're sourcing for is not an inclusive environment. Exactly. Um, Balash was talking about like what considerations to have when you're building a sourcing team. Uh, you had a amazing hiring sharing about. Uh, you know, kind of when you do outreach, some of the things to think about, uh, partly based on the, you know, the, the data that they have. Uh, and yeah, it was just, it was uh, five weeks of, of goodness. Uh, the it Luke was Americans really, it really was going in detail. Yeah. And, and it was fun. And yeah. it was a free course, uh, you know, just in the beginning of the lockdown when most of us was had not much else to do uh, than to sit in front of our screen. And uh, it, it was a lot of fun. And yeah, we had almost 5,000 people sign up by the end of the, 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 the training uh, and the recordings afterwards. And um, like it's up to over 6,000 people who've signed up for it uh, like to date, uh, which was brilliant. I mean, I can see some of the countries signing up. Uh, you had, I think, over 100 different countries people sign up for this um, from, from countries that you wouldn't think about like there are sources in that. Like I remember I just kind of, I was looking through some of the attendees. Uh, one of them is an American woman working in Afghanistan. So you even had Afghanistan following uh, the training, which was like, it was just brilliant. Wow. And uh, it, it was fun. And a lot of, like, I know I was talking to Kim and Gordon as well. A lot of what they get asked for is like, when are we getting more of that? Like, okay, we've done the basics now. You know, how do we move on from here and what's the next step? And it's why we're putting on the, 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 the training in February uh, is to get like, what's the next step in terms of basic training? And this was specifically on tech sourcing. How do we do more training about general sourcing? So if you're not doing tech, there's other things to think about as yep. well. And then what's the next step in terms of advanced? So it's why we're putting up a, another basic training and another, and then an advanced training, uh, because then once you've done that, you're ready for Aaron's expert training. Oh yeah. Uh, but if you don't have the basic and the advanced, then you're not ready for Aaron's. Uh, but you definitely like all those three taken together, and you're gonna get to a level where, uh, you know, that this is when it starts getting fun. It's like what you and me have been through as well over the last couple of years. It's like how do we get from wanting to know everything there is to know about sourcing to getting to that level where it's like okay. I understand what Aaron does and I can do it. Um, but, you know, there's still a couple of levels until I can you know, do things like that as Aaron do. Yeah. Um, and that was the fun thing. It's like having people from everywhere in the community. And, you know, and at the same time, it's just when you catch yourself in that moment when you are attending a, a conference and one of your heroes is talking about something and you're like, oh, my God, I know this is exactly what I'm doing. And you're like, ah! You know, and you know, coming back to coming back to the uh, the sourcing course, I think what was incredible that uh, so many people worked behind the scenes to actually deliver something for free. That doesn't happen that often, and uh, I think that now looking back at, at 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 the year, there were so many events that happened afterwards, right? However, I believe that this was one of the first really big uh, events that was online for sourcers. Yeah. And even before the conferences went viral, like, you know, virtual, but it really was just, you know, people join together and say, hey, we want to give something back. And for me, this is exactly what the sourcing community is. It's about giving back. Yes, people will be earning money there and there, but still, you know, to get access to these people, like, you know, for us, it's easier because they are our friends. We meet them at conferences, but for someone for example, as you said, for someone who's in, in, in Afghanistan right now, they would not have a possibility to go to, uh, you know, to, to an event, a live event. So maybe, you know, uh, the fact that a lot of things went virtual, you know, it turned out to be better for a lot of people. However, of course, you know, being the first is one thing. And then a lot of things spread in the different shapes and forms out of that. But it was, I did the course as well. I was so thrilled. Um, it was so refreshing and as well, it touched upon different aspects, not just technical sourcing, uh, because if you just do technical side of things, 
it only works if you just generate lists. Yeah. But if you need to engage with people, you will not know how to do that as well. And it was brilliant to see as well. Like, obviously, you had a big influence with people like, like influencers like Vanessa Rath kind of getting a lot of the South African community. But even from that, like I've seen, I saw people from Nigeria, from Kenya, from Senegal, uh, the South American community came out and I'm not even sure if like kind of, because I, I try to obviously with the, sh with the sourcing challenge show, I try to kind of find people in the different kind of countries. And it's like, I've had some, in, you know, some interviews with like the Jonathan uh, with Kelly in, in Brazil. But you had people from Brazil, from like, lots of people from Brazil. You had Chile. You had uh, Bolivia. You obviously had Ar Argentina and Venezuela. It's like that. Like just countries like Saint, Saint Lucia, which is like, what I then found out afterwards. Is like there was a group of sorcerers working for a Canadian company, but living in the Caribbean nation of Saint Lucia. Wow. I was like, I didn't. You know, you don't. You need to find that. them. No, I and mean, you don't connect. <laughs> Like, you know, a Caribbean nation with sourcing, but yeah. a lot of them, like they're native English speakers. And, you know, obviously the cost of living there is lower than it would be in Canada. So, but all of those kind of connections, it's like, wow, this is, you know, Mauritius, things like that. Obviously you had lots yeah. of, you know, lots of Americans, lots of British, Dutch, uh, Indian, but the number of countries and people in different countries that came out for this, because there was no barrier of entry in terms of it's going to cost you, you know, a hundred euros or something like that, which for us would be okay. But for somebody in, in Africa might exactly. be prohibitively large. Exactly. Uh, and then, you know, and nice to have to that access, to have that access to, um, well, to be honest, your, your, your people that you've been following directly and to have the option to ask questions is invaluable. Yeah. It's incredible to have that. Yeah. And it was exactly that. Like, you had the training and then you had Q and A, you know, you had the option to ask questions from, yeah, Kim and Gordon and, uh, and Joanne and Balash, you know, just having that is like, you had direct access to them if you were yep. there in person, uh, oh, yeah. you know, that was brilliant. And it was like, it was a really good, it, it was something like, I talked with Amazing Hiring about that for a couple of years and it was, it was a brilliant kind of timing because of the lockdown and people were at home anyway. And it's like, oh, you know, we had a lot more people sign up than I think even amazing hiring had. Like I was joking that we're like, oh, we're going for 5,000. And by the time we started the event, it was like 4,000 or something like that. Uh, and I know now it's been way more than 6,000 people who've actually yeah. signed up for it. It's like, that's the brilliant thing. Uh, but yeah, it was just a perfect timing for that. Uh, also in, in April, um, if anybody has been following Andrew, uh, Andre Bradshaw uh, and his, uh, so Andre, I had an interview with him on, on Sourcing Challenge Show as well. Uh, definitely go back and look at that. Also one of those people that I'm lucky that I got to meet. Uh, I met him at SourceCon in Atlanta, but it's one of the people that I came out of nowhere from my point of view. And then all of a sudden just was just sharing things left and right, like just giving back to the community like crazy and um, creating things which is and creating things different. it's like uh, I, I saw him very early about because he's one of the ones that like has done what a lot of us would love to do actually learn to code to become better at his job of sourcing and now combining those things it's like he works as a sourcer but he develops his old own tools um but at the same time as developing his own tool for the company he works for, he also shares that with the community. So he started by just sharing it openly. Uh, he had, you know, quickly, which was, it was a Chrome plugin, but uh, because of the way that Google works and it's just a pain to actually get it approved and to maintain it. Um, in April, he took it off the Chrome store uh, because it's just, they, they kept rejecting his updates. Uh, and put it on Patreon has said, look, if you want me to continue working on this uh, and get the latest uh, updates, uh, support me on Patreon uh, to the, I think it's like $3 is the lowest, $3, $5, $5, you, you get the latest. Uh, I'm on the $10 plan. So you get all the new videos and all the new uh, quickly updates, but also he just keeps building. Oh, you need, the latest one was like somebody needed a tool to uh, to get all the, the 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 comments from a YouTube channel. So uh, you know him, Andre being Andre, built that. He's like, oh, I think I have something like that somewhere. So he built it over the weekend, um, 
And if you're really into the nuts and bolts, uh, Andre shares while he is developing this. Like, so it's the most incredible thing. He programs to... like so. Uh, like, uh, Aaron is uh, he's always on this. Like I, I've been on it a couple of times. Where it's like he's gonna do it live on YouTube while he is coding his tool and explaining why he does what he does and what yep. that specific function and the variable. Um, and it's interactive. So if you ask him a question, it's like, why did you know he's going to share that with you? Uh, yeah, he just keeps putting on more and more on what he actually does. I love that he did a Patreon model now, which I think he's up to 400 something dollars a month so that it's not, he doesn't have to do it for free because he does spend a lot of time on this. So, you know, it keeps building. Uh, if you're into getting the most out of your LinkedIn, LinkedIn recruiter, uh, you know, different, and you're looking for tools, uh, Andre quickly is the place to go. Um, I'll put a link to his Patreon. Definitely worth uh, every one of the, the $10 a month that I spend on making sure I have, not even that I have the latest quickly, but whenever Andre puts out something new, I'm the first one to know. And I love being a part of that. And I love supporting creators like Andre uh, yeah. to continue doing what he's doing. And it's super reliable. That's the thing. That's, yeah. that's the most incredible part, but you know exactly who created it. You see him, you see his, uh, you see how he's doing it. And the fact that he comes up with, oh yeah, I can build this. I can build that. I can build this. I can build that. So it's incredible to be part of that journey together because you're shaping the product as well. That's the most incredible place to be. Oh, the next one, uh, Online Sourcing Learning Day. You were actually there live, Dov. So yeah, maybe uh, tell us a bit about what that event was about. I was. I think that maybe, first of all, it, it potentially is like a spin-off from Amazing Hiring Concepts. Uh, just the difference was that it was way shorter. It was one day. And we had Balash, uh, Kim, and Gordon. Irina, David, Marcel, and Guillaume. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying surnames because, guys, if you're listening to this <laughs> podcast, I'm sure you know who, I, who I'm talking uh, about. Most of them have been on the show as well, so yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, uh, and, and some of the surnames are really tricky for me to pronounce. Um, <laughs> however, uh, it was one day, and each, each of them had a session, and they were talking about their, uh, you know, specific topics. To be honest, I don't necessarily remember right now uh you know what was their focus of course locking birds were really uh, really uh i think techie. balash was i think balash was talking about facebook at that time so yeah it, like yes. all of them I, all of them kind of have different specialities which was what the made the day really good because again it was like it's all about you know sourcing but with the different specialisms that they can all focus on and you know that as well, I think it was a very interesting model to see because it was paid. I think it was like around $150 or something. Yeah, something like that. Which is very reasonable if you really consider the uh, people who are doing it. Yeah, six hours of training content, definitely. You know, it's that, nothing. It's, no. and, 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 and I think that this is the most important thing for everyone to understand that investing in yourself is the only best thing that you can do but look at the online well look at the conferences the in-person conferences most of them is like uh 20 to 30 trainers well talks but most of it is like half an hour talks uh you have a lot of them is like there's two or three tracks at the same time so oh, you only really get to see if you do everything you get to see maybe 12 or 18 half an hour talks and a couple of keynotes and people have no problem paying three, five, seven hundred dollars, even nine hundred. Yeah, and plus that's just the event fee. Plus then the travel, the hotels, the food, the taking three days away from work, and you know. But what you get is that afterwards you have these eighteen talks in your head. You might have a couple of slides. Where this is like it's one hundred and fifty for six hours of content, where you get you get the recordings afterwards. So if you forget something you go back and you listen to it again, which is going back to Aaron's course. It's like, if Aaron just does a talk, you're lost, but that you can go back and take one step at a time, which is yeah. what I love about this. And it's like, yeah, it was very reasonable priced, uh, probably underpriced. And 
I think they had a hundred and something people, which was like really good. I and think I, there I, I were would, even more. Yeah, I would love to see more of these. I know that they're looking at bringing it back next year at some point as well. Um, so yeah, and I mean, it gave us, that's why I talked to Kim and Gordon about like bringing that back as well, is that having that, you know, we don't need to have 70 trainers going through four days. It's just information overload have a smaller group, uh, which is why it's just going to be the four of us doing all of February uh, because like that's going to give you much more intense and you can go more in depth. Uh, and I would love to do more of those events where it's like, keep it small in terms of the number of people involved. Uh, and I would like, as I, we talked about before as well, like I would, when we go back to in-person events, I would much rather spend two or three days with 50 people and do much more of a mastermind kind of session where it's like, we're going to do theory in the morning. We're going to do practical in the afternoon. And then we're going to party the hell out of it in the evening. And yeah. then we're going to do that all over. But, and we're going to sit down with you like, what's your tricky roles that you're working on? Let's spend the next two days of teaching you the tools that you need. So you go back and on Monday, you know exactly where to start on these searches. That's what I would much rather do than, you know, the 900 people conferences where you come out and you're like, I, I did four talks, maybe the rest of it was like, yeah, just meeting my friends. And, you know, I, I was actually reflecting on, on the whole concept of online conferences that we've been experiencing this year. We're going to be mentioning a few as well, but uh, maybe one of the reasons why uh, conferences are trying to attract as many people or make it really long it's to um, kind of find the reason why they charge so much. That's the, only, that's the only way. But if you remove all of that, I mean, okay, you can compare, I think, even Sourcing Summit was around 150 euros or something. Or It was not very expensive for a virtual. Uh, was it more? I think it was more. That's just the recordings. I think it's 150. Okay. Yeah. But like, still, you know, like you, when you compare, like, okay, you have 150, okay, if, if it's similar level, yeah. but you have only, someone would say it's only six hours, but I can get for the same amount, I can get the recordings. But the thing is that recording is just a recording. You, if you don't have an interaction, if you don't have a Q&A, and if you don't have access to those people, like people have an opportunity to connect with them. Yeah, you that's know? the and thing. Like is, what, you're, what you're paying for is that, you have that access. It's like, yeah, if I'm one of 70 speakers at a conference and you want to take, you know, two, three hours of my time afterwards, if I have time, I might. But if I know that I'm like, I'm one of six speakers, trainers, and you're one of the 200 people who signed up and paid for my, like, I'm going to spend that extra time on Q&A and jumping on a call or screen share with you because it's yeah. like, you're not just one of a thousand people at a conference, like you're one of a couple of hundred people that paid specifically for my training. Uh, and that's when we do paid training events, that's it. It's like, yeah, the recordings you can get like of a lot of things, but it's like, it's, it's possible for us to go much more in depth and it's possible for you to be there live. But also if you're not there live, it's just like having that access to ask us questions afterwards and us knowing that is like, that's part of that kind of whole deal we have with you. Exactly. So yeah, definitely. But yeah, uh, I wasn't there live, but I got the recordings. Uh, I got to see the recordings and I absolutely loved it. Uh, like I know all of the trainers and I love what they were kind of sharing. Um, you know, Kim and Gordon are always good for, for very in-depth training. Uh, Balash has, like, Balash is one of those as well. Like, you know, one of those people that you always, you know, known about in the industry. Um, so, you know, getting to meet him and considering him my friend, um, same thing. Uh, and yeah, Irina and David has built up an, a brilliant company of training for, for the last many, many years. Um, I've met both of them live. I sat down and had drinks with David in the U.S. and talked business and, uh, they continue to coming up with new things. I think this was a, a brilliant concept, um, yeah. set the stage for a lot of, uh, you know, online kind of training. And I think it's going to set the stage for what's going, coming, coming from the future. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's definitely something to watch out. Uh, I don't know if, if you can access 
uh, the uh, older uh, it, recordings if you do. It, but it will. I, would um, yeah. I, I checked, and I'll put a link to that as well. Uh, they're still selling digital, uh, the recordings access to the online uh, sourcing learning day. Um, so you can still buy access to actually getting the recordings from what was happening that day. Uh, yeah, definitely have a look at that because it's still, it's timeless information. Uh, it's still something that you should definitely have a look at. We are in June. So what happened in June? One of them is like uh, Jan came out with his uh, newest edition of the full stack recruiter. Uh, this time the ultimate edition. Uh, I was lucky enough to get one of the well, first examples of it. Uh, as I mentioned a couple of times. Uh, so yeah, this is the, the 750 page uh, Bible of online uh, sourcing and recruiting um, by Jan Tixe, uh, rewritten. A lot of it is completely new material and it's not the whole thing. <laughs> There's 150 pages extra that did not make it into the print edition purely because it's just prohibitively expensive to, once you get over a certain size, it gets so expensive to print that it wouldn't be worth it. Um, so there's another 150 pages that once you have the book, you can go to uh, Jan's website and actually get um, the other 150 pages. Um, so the whole book is more than uh, like it's almost 900 pages long. Um, so definitely, uh, you know, and it's not like I, there's a lot of text on each page. It's not like massively written. It's not a children's book, um, but Definitely, uh, that was the, one of the highlights of my year, uh, not just because I consider Jan a friend, but definitely uh, seeing him continue just putting out material uh, and getting this out uh, was definitely a big part for Jan. And I don't think people understand how much work goes into it. Like, it's not just about writing this. I think Jan spent the most part of 2000, like the first half of 2020 editing and doing layout of the book like everything was done and he'd written it but getting it edited like we're not native english speakers so getting a book out in print form that makes somewhat sense to read in english uh you know that's like the way i write and it, it's not going to be perfect in english and jan made a lot and he spent a lot of money which is like he's not <laughs> That's what we were talking about as well. It's not like he's making a lot of money by actually, you know, publishing this book. Like if you know the number of like the, the money that Jan spent to make this what it is uh, on editors and layouts and things like that, uh, it's a lot of work that went into this. I was lucky enough to get a lot of kind of advanced copy of what he was writing and helping him with some of the things. Uh, and it was, it was really extremely nice to see that process similar to, um, we did the same with Katrina when she was writing her book to get a lot of kind of what she was writing and like getting examples like this, this makes sense to you from a kind of sourcing point of view. Uh, and I was very lucky to be a part of that. Um, so yeah, that came out in the uh, you know, first half of the year and it was, it was brilliant to see. Whoa <laughs> I haven't. So that's the thing I need to, uh, I need to revisit uh, because I was so, you know, as I said, like I was so away from sourcing world this year that, and yeah, definitely this is the book that it's it's worth looking into. That's as easy as that. Like it's, uh, I think there is a Kindle version for that as well, right? There is a Kindle version. Uh, I, I I keep pestering him to make an audio version. It's not Jan is not going to make an audio version, so we'll see. We might. We might be able to get an audio version somehow because the, yeah, that's definitely the way that I read books quicker. Uh, yeah. Even if I'm reading the book, if I can double speed the audio, it's going to be much faster than me actually reading things. Um, so maybe one day we'll see. Well, hopefully he can get like a voiceover person to do it if he would not. Yeah, do it he's not. He's not. He's again cost a lot of money to do. It's not. I think financially, it's just not worth it. Um, so we'll see. We might. We might get that one day. So July, yeah. uh, evolution of sourcing role. Uh, you put a brilliant article there from uh, yeah, Christine Hampton. Yeah. And I hadn't read this when it came out, but it's uh, definitely an interesting article about, I think we have this, it's like, and there's a couple of different schools of thought in terms of the sourcing. Like you have that, what is sourcing and what's recruitment? Uh, you know what? Sorry, uh, because you were breaking the whole, like you were interrupted 
I sh I suggest to start from scratch okay. because there's gonna be just to chunk that out. <laughs> cool. All right, July. Um, you suggested an article, "Evolution of Sourcing Role" by Christine Hampton. Uh, I hadn't seen this uh, article when it came out, but definitely it's interesting to me. Um, yeah, you have a lot of different school of thought, especially in sourcing. Uh, you have the one of us that probably are more recruiters than sourcers. If you look at the original sources, where a lot of kind of a lot of traditional sources believe that sourcing is only about the research, um, whereas a lot of what I end up doing, and I think you do a similar thing, similar to my wife, where we do a lot more of the role than just doing the research. Like we are actually engaging with candidates uh, for a lot of what I do is, is much more of a 360 recruiter role than just pure sourcing. Um, but what, yeah, what Christine wrote here is the different kind of, the different levels of sourcing and the way that she sees it. And, and I like that. Um, so it's definitely, you know, food for thought in terms of where you find yourself on, on that kind of spectrum of sourcing. Yeah, because it's, you know, looking, looking at the, um, at the, even, even how those sources are named, like, for example, the legacy source or community source or, and the pipeline or, I mean, industry evangelist. It's so cool, right? Because, um, you know, what we already t talked uh, a little earlier that um, we do have different types of sources. And whenever you're applying for a job as a sourcer, for me, the first question is like, what is a sourcer for you and your team? Because it can be absolutely anything. Um, it can be a junior recruiter, it can be a coordinator, or it can be someone who is doing research and just pipelining, you know, making lists. But then it can be an overall like 360 stuff. Some companies still see that as a source or, you know, it can be so confusing and so different for each of the, uh, for each of the um, specific companies, right? And I think that looking at this, um, it might give you an understanding, first of all, what are the options out there, which is very healthy to understand. Uh, and maybe as well to kind of, then when, once you know what to expect, uh, who are you? Which is even more important to know what, what are your preferences? Where are your strengths? Do you want to engage with people or you just want to build lists? Do you want to nurture them or you just want to get rid of them as soon as they say yes to you, you know? And there are, you know, it's very individual. Uh, so looking at this might just give you some ideas uh, to consider. No, definitely. And if you look at the, you know, 64 different episodes of the Sourcing Challenge show, uh, if, you, if you actually listen to all of them or watched all of them, you'll see 64 different ways of thinking of sourcing. Um, you know, we, I'm very specific about, I know that some of the people that I've interviewed for the show do not consider themselves a sourcer. Um, that's purely me putting that moniker on them, um, why I put them on the show. But you have people who are no longer in the industry sourcing, but are using the skills that they learned to do what they do now. And, and you have people who see themselves much more as a, as a you know, 360 recruiter, but believe like me that if you don't do sourcing, then you're not really recruiting. Like, you know, post and pray doesn't work anymore. Um, but, but you have all of the different variables, like all 64 are doing things very differently because we all understand it differently. And yeah, every, every job ad that you see out there with, you know, talent sourcer and sourcer or active sourcer, it's like job descriptions don't mean anything. You make the most of it yourself. And it's all about like what your discipline is, but also like looking for you is like finding out like you know, where am I weak, but where do I want to focus? It's going to enable you to see as well, like, who do I want to learn from? Like, which training is it that I want? Uh, which conferences is it I want to go to? Uh, maybe you're much more on the research part, and maybe, you know, focusing much more on the OSINT part is, is more interesting for you. Or maybe you're, you know, you're much more on the kind of techie part where like Andre Bradshaw and, and Aaron Linz is the people that you want to follow. So there is there's so many disciplines out there within our like admittedly very specialized niche already within recruitment. Um, so yeah, have a, have a look at that kind of, this is going to give you a good, a good, good thinking. Um, but, um, but it's at the same time, it's, it's going to, 
you know, get your brain cells moving is like, what do I want to be and where do I want to go? Yeah, and, and exactly the same thing um, we could mention about the conferences uh, where, uh, you know, it's one thing to go to a conference and to be there for three days and to be like emerge into all of that knowledge and content. But realistically, not everything that we hear, we can apply to our job. And it's incredible to, to, to hear what other people are doing. But if you're not, for example, sourcing tech talent, none of the tech tools or slacks or like meetups can be relevant to you unless your audience is there. However, uh, as well to reflect on what you said, when you, when you get these skills of sourcing, the beauty of that is even if you walk away from the industry, you will see information differently and you will be able to still uh, get the, um, that expertise of certain aspects of what is sourcing or scraping or like analyzing data, cleaning data uh, and all of those uh, more techy advanced things, but ours, maybe your family members would be like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> um, and I, I'll never forget when I was in my last uh, full-time uh, job that I had, uh, I was in the open office and um, unfortunately or fortunately enough, it was more unfortunate. I was sitting um, like there were rows of free laptops, you know, free, free desks, right? And, and I was in the, I wasn't situated with recruiters or sourcers. I had uh, directors uh, and, and other more senior people, you know, in my kind of hub. And, you know, I would have this big screen and I would run um, high multi-highlighter and everything like at the code and this and that. And I would try to step away and, and look into my screen and think, what if the random stranger <laughs> would be passing by through my desk, would think I'm doing all day long. They would not understand a thing. You know, if, if, if my manager would come to them and ask, hey, so what is Dov doing all day? <laughs> they would be like, uh, I don't know. And this is normal. So, uh, you know, just embrace the fact that people will not understand what you do and you need just to continue doing because, you know, once you know which of the type of sorcerers you are, I think it will be easier to just be true to yourself and just own it. Absolutely. We got to July, uh, July for us, for both of us. Uh, so I think the first, well, the first big online conference that I actually went to, uh, Sourcing Summit Virtual, uh, the first one um, for us has been like three this year, uh, two virtual European one and then a German one. Uh, but this is, uh, this was, well, definitely was the biggest one is also like the one that I look back to as that was, I guess, a really good conference. Uh, both Dove and I got to speak, even though that wasn't necessarily the plan. Um, I was uh, I was the MC uh, on some of the later uh, afternoon tracks. Um, I was playing music in the music room. I mean, exactly. <laughs> you know, for me, that was just mind blowing because if, if someone would have told me, you know, when I went to the first Sosu, that uh, I will have a chance to share my passion for music and to show music to people. I would not believe that, but you know, but every single year there's something more creative coming up from the conferences as well, which is really cool because we have a lot of creative people in the, in the community. And, you know, I, I, I would want to see more of that, that they would have more opportunities to show their talents. And now with virtual, it, I think it's even easier. So it's definitely... No, it was it was brilliant because you kind of like, if you've been to, to um, Sourcing Summit in Amsterdam, uh, you know that there is always like this good night and it's like, you know, Bobby is normally there as a DJ, um, but at the same, and he was there as well, but at the same time you have like, you had the, you know, the disco and the, the, the DJ track, and then you have you playing, you know, the indie music, which was brilliant because you get, you get to cater, that's the thing with the online format, you get to cater for people with different interests. Uh, and if you're not the, you know, the, the club music and the, the, the kind of disco track, then yeah, maybe you're into indie. Uh, and we got to combine that with, I think, what, 70 speakers was at the, the first Sourcing Summit, which if that was live, would have been completely overkill. 
uh, it was probably overkill, you know. It was an overkill anyway. Yeah, it's a bit, I mean, both we, we both talked about this. It's like, like even me, like I love going through videos. Um, I haven't even, I haven't made headway of any of like, I haven't even started on the videos from the, from the Sourcing Summit virtual because it's just too much information for me. Mm -hmm. uh, you get some repetition, uh, which sometimes can be good because you get the same topic with a different angle. Uh, but then, you know, I think the problem with a lot of the virtual conferences, we talked about in last week's show as well, like a lot of the virtual conferences is you just like they're trying to cater to everybody. So you want somebody to speak about every conceivable topic within the sourcing slash recruiting world, uh, which you just, you, which means people like me that are very specific about what I want to listen to. It's like sometimes there's not there's nothing for me to want to hear uh, because it's either people have already heard before or it's new content from people that I have no connection to and what they're talking about is not interesting to me. So, yeah, uh, you got some of that in some of the later online conferences, but this was definitely like I loved um, the first Sourcing Summit virtual. Um, and we, we learned a lot from doing that, um, but we also learned a lot of kind of, you know, like there's definitely too many speakers. But you know, at the same time, uh, comparing to the other events, not just the Sourcing Summit, but I would say that the very first uh, Sourcing Summit virtual was very smooth. Mm. The way everything happened, you know, there were no issues with tech, uh, you know, everything was running on time. Like, it was really incredible experience. And because it was the very first, you know, experience of a conference and because of the platform that, uh, that was chosen, mm -hmm. it did feel that it is a very personal event. And what that I was think, really cool. what I also think that uh, Phil got right, which uh, other conferences are still getting wrong, is that 90% of the content was live. It was, the speaker was speaking live. It was not a recording with some, I have some of the later conferences. I'm like, why would I go, why would I be there at a certain time if all you're gonna show me is a recording anyway? You can just add the recording to the list. Just and that's it. send me the links to the video and I can show up whenever I and want. I watch and it I, whenever I want. And yeah. I don't have to sit through all your commercials, which is what most of the, like some of the conferences that ended up like, oh, it's for free, but I'm going to push down half of the talks are paid, you know, from vendors. I'm like, nah. Uh, and it's like, and the actual content is recorded. I'm like, that's no point. Uh, whereas this was live, Q&A was live. Uh, which also gave you like, and it's why we ended up speaking because like you have, you inevitably have people who are going to drop out um, and that's what happened. So I ended up getting a keynote with 12 hours notice and you end up getting a, you know, with no hours notice, you end up like, we need somebody on stage in half an hour, dub, you're it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and for me, it was just so crazy because I, I remember I woke up in a very bad mood and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this conference and I don't understand what I'm doing I'm playing music I'm playing music in the conference you know and I was supposed to talk about something but then something was sh something shifted with the schedule as it happens and I was just furious and I went for a walk and then I came back and I just I got myself a sunflower just to make my mood a little bit better and then two minutes later I saw the message in the in the group chat and at first I thought that it's room free, you know, where I'm just playing music anyway, and I'm just going to fill in the gaps and I had no idea that it's going to be big stage. I was like, oh, <laughs> one hour? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I ended up talking about for one hour. And, and I think that that was a lesson to me personally that sometimes the best things happen without much planning. And I would... And even looking back and when I would be making a presentation or I would need to pre pre prepare a presentation, the way my brain works, I would finish presentation two hours before I go on stage. No, I mean, some of the best talks, some of the best trainings are the ones that you just have to do impromptu. I mean, yeah. we've both been to the live events as well. It's like my first sourcing summit, uh, when I arrived and I already prepared a talk and, and Phil was like, yeah, somebody dropped out that was supposed to travel there. You're going to need to speak on day two as well. Um, so I needed to do a second talk. 
the day two. So you know, again, had 24 hours to come up with a second talk. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, okay. I'm like, I don't get nerves like that. And it's like, I'll find, I mean, it's not like, look, we do this every week. It's not like we have problems talking about things that we haven't necessarily prepared to talk about. We have only, the only problem is that we, uh, we can easily talk for hours and hours. And then the question is, how many people will listen to that? <laughs> <laughs> because we're having fun anyway. So, yeah. uh, but, you know, I, and I relate to, to that as well when, when I had a very big challenge for myself mentally when I needed to, to close the uh, social last year. Uh, it was, for me, just mind-blowing to just like how I'm going to come up with something that is original, interesting for everyone in the audience. And, and I remember I was already flying to Amsterdam, still having just, you know, um, ideas. I didn't, like, I already had a presentation-ish, but only on the last day, because I knew that there's an, one element is missing. And then I think on the, day, on the second day, I saw Balash's talk with the live uh, voting and stuff. And I went to Balash, I was like, this is exactly what is missing for me. And, and I think I already was talking to him, you know, a few days beforehand because I was like, I needed to incorporate it, but I only managed to do the whole thing on the last day. And I think one of the things that is missing from those uh, online events, especially if you have 70 speakers and three rooms, uh, which you can and online and you can have, you know, people from everywhere in the world. But what people, people who are not normally speaking at conferences, what you don't understand is that if I'm speaking on day two or three, I am sitting in day one and I am listening to the keynotes. I am listening to the other talks. I am even on the day that I'm doing a talk, I'm listening to the guy who's before me and I will build references to those talks into my talk because I know that you, you've been in the keynotes. Like yeah. I can reference the opening keynote because I know you were there with yeah. the online conferences. One, I don't necessarily have time because I'm, I haven't taken out time to actually be at the whole conference because I'm working I'm at home. Uh, and two, I don't know if you were in the keynote or if you just tuned in an hour ago because it's like, you know, there's not, whereas if we're in a hotel in Amsterdam, then I know you were in the keynote because why wouldn't you be? You paid to be at the conference. Uh, and that is a completely different kind of thinking. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's some of the kind of things that, that, us as both as event organizers and as speakers that we need to work on and you know and, and and at the same time one of the most rewarding things is seeing your friends other speakers attending your talk because it's the support and it's just the, the beauty of just being there and exchanging and 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 you that's the thing you never know who's going to reference you without you even possibly thinking of it I had a few times when it happened, I was like, uh huh? It's like, what just happened? I was like, is that even a cool idea? I was like, I would never think of that, you know? But things happen randomly. So, um, and, and yeah, and you know, we talked about that a lot that I believe that 2021 will show different, hopefully different kind of events. Because I think what we have, yeah, you know, we've tested and we've seen what is working, what is not working. But I believe it's time to niche down and offer something that is more targeting specific niche rather than targeting everyone in the community and then running smaller and then running smaller more curated events mm -hmm. rather than these big a week long marathons. But what we have gotten by doing a lot of speakers is a lot of people have gotten the chance to speak for the first time yes a lot of the ones that might not have stood up on the blue or the red stage in in amsterdam in front of you know 400 people because they just don't have the nerves for that but where they've like you know what i can do a half an hour talk online I, I feel comfortable with that especially because we're all on video calls every day now that's like that's that's less of a barrier so and because you've had these 70 50 speaker events a lot of people have gotten the chance to test out what it means to prepare and to talk uh, and i'm hoping that that's gonna bleed over to when we do get back to uh face-to-face -face conferences that 
a lot more of those would be like, okay, this isn't my first talk anymore. I'm comfortable standing in front of 400 or 600 people and doing the same thing in person. But, you know, at the same time, the, the twist here is that those who've been talking at live events, they say that I've heard that it's even harder to talk in front of an empty, you know, uh, basically you're talking to yourself and you have no interaction in the moment. I'm not talking about the Q&A part, uh, but I'm talking about you don't see the reaction from people uh, because sometimes that is a very good indicator whether the audience is connecting with what you're saying or not. You need to then come up with something to react, to wake them up or to do something. And you can't do that if you actually don't, if you just see, oh, okay, there's 150 people listening. It doesn't say anything. The person might be on mute and on the phone to <laughs> doing an interview, but you think that they're there. So uh, it is a different world, but um, I'm really curious to see where it's going to go. And, yeah, and how things are gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change. Okay. Uh, we didn't find anything from August. Uh, mm. I didn't do much. In it August. was summer. <laughs> it was summer. We just finished a uh, sourcing summit. I think a lot of us took some time off. Uh, I'm lucky enough to live in a country that got out of lockdown in June. Uh, the swimming pool was back open and it's just down here. Uh, my, uh, my five-year-old at that time wanted to learn how to swim. And we were lucky enough that one of our neighbors was a swim teacher. So yeah, that's what I remember from August. Uh, but what we did find in September, uh, was, uh, a podcast. Um, I listened to a lot of podcasts, some of it recruitment related, most of it not. Uh, but what I remember listening to in September was, uh, again, Maisha Cannon, uh, the article writer from January, uh, was on uh, Rob Stevenson's Talk Talent to Me. Um, Rob has been podcasting in the recruitment and sourcing space for uh, years. Rob used to be with Intello and did their uh, sourcing on um, hiring on all cylinders, um, which I think it's still going on. But since Rob left um, Intello, isn't quite the same. Uh, Rob is now with Hired and has a... Uh, frequent podcast called Talk Talent to Me, where he interviews uh, heads of talent, uh, VPs, senior managers, and had Maisha on, who, yeah, we talked about before. Maisha is a prolific conference a keynote speaker, writes article, is always well-researched, and talk to her about um, her job. Um, if you know Maisha, you will know that she's moved from uh, Las Vegas, where I believe she, moved, she lived before, and she moved to Canada, before the lockdown. So she's now in, I think she's in Vancouver uh, and Rob and uh, her talked about that, what it meant to be, you know, uh, working during lockdown and things like that. So a really good podcast episode uh, and yeah, more goodness from Maisha Cannon. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, actually, I'm checking one thing uh, that just came to my head and uh, Maybe it's worth adding to the list. However, it was officially released just before Christmas a year ago. Um, however, I don't know, we can cut this out if you want, but, <laughs> uh, but basically uh, I saw quite a big fuss uh, in the sourcing community. Everyone sharing one documentary on Netflix, don't fuck with cats. Basically you have strangers who don't know each other, they're in different locations. And there's one event that triggers something in them when they want to, they want to find who did it. And they actually start using all the OSINT tools and everything uh, who are not sorcerers. They have, they're not detectives, they're nothing. Like one of them works for a casino or something, you know, and, and they build this community of people who try to find the person who did certain thing Excellent. and it and it turns into this really insane search and i think that a lot of sorcerers they when they were looking at it they were like oh this is what i do on a daily basis <laughs> <laughs> so i just remembered that this is yeah we we might want to add this to the list as well yeah definitely um october young kim who's uh one of the prolific sharers of information in our community, a lot of the Facebook groups, uh, shared the Bellingcat Online Investigation Toolkit. Uh, and it's definitely anybody who's 
been around the, the kind of sourcing slash OSINT world in the last couple of years uh, would know that Bellingcat is one of those organizations that do a lot of research for good. Uh, they would, they're the kind of ones that look at, you know, videos uploaded by ISIS and Al Qaeda and trying to find out where it's from, uh, you know, looking at different, can we use map information and the views to find out, you know, where, where this was taken. They did a lot of research into uh, the shoot down of uh, a plane over Ukraine to find out, you know, who did it and things like that. Um, so a lot of the kind of tools that they use for, uh, you know, open source uh, intelligence, uh, the tool set is in here and there's a lot of goodness. I mean, you can, we could talk for days just on every kind of tools, like what we could use it for and what we have used it for. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and this is what we spoke earlier. It's just, it depends on what things you need and your role, because not everything that you would find there is actually applicable, but just going and trying to pick the different sheets, you know, and tabs apart and just trying to identify what is exactly that could benefit me and then just trying to test those tools uh, because some of the tools are free, some of them are paid. Then you just see if you have any budget or if you even need that. But if you don't, you know, there's a lot of free tools. And OSINT is now in a way became this massive buzzword that everyone started using OSINT tools. A bunch of people don't even know what it means. I honestly, uh, you know, for me, uh, if, if it comes to OSINT, it's always Lockenbergs uh, that I kind of, for me, they were the first that I maybe heard the, the term. Um, and, and they did quite a few uh, sessions and SOSUs over the years. But it goes both ways. So uh, if you follow the OSINT community, um, they, they, they read Jan's book. And yeah. there, was a, there was a review of Jan's book by uh, one of the people in the OSINT community and saying, look, not, everyone, not everything is relevant to the OSINT community that Jan is writing in his book. But a lot of it is. Um, so they, they look to us for a lot of what we're doing. So there's a lot of kind of cross-contamination in terms of that. Uh, definitely the Lokenbergs, uh, because they went as far as actually to get OSINT training. Um, yeah. And I think OSINT... They're officially certified. They are. And it's like what the kind of OSINT community has is a lot of it is born out of the, the military intelligence and the, the police of kind of like... So there's a lot more systems in of like how they do things. And there's a lot more... Um, uh, training that is systematized on that so that you have different levels of what you're able to do. So there's much more of a, of a standard for what is OSINT trained specialist and expert mean. Uh, whereas we can definitely learn a lot from that in the sourcing community where it's a bit free for all. Um, so yeah, I mean, definitely they're my go-to as well. Uh, Jan has done a lot of research in as well. Dennis is, uh, like Dennis has a, a, a Twitter channel as well, where everything that he finds around this, uh, he puts on there as well. So uh, there's a lot of kind of crossing between the OSINT community and the sourcing community. And it's, it's here to stay. Uh, another rabbit hole that, you know, depending on kind of where you feel that you want to go in your career, uh, you can go down that um, if, if that's kind of what floats your boat. If you're looking for a lot of different research tools, then that's a good thing. But at the same time, I mean, what a lot of, and this, this tool list as well, what it does to me is that a lot of times you go in and you look at a tool and it's like, I didn't think of that as a channel for me to source on. I'm not necessarily going to use the tool, but it's going to get me to think about different places to look for the people that I want to find. And that's what it does to me. Yeah. And as well, it does, it's not just for sourcing and for searching, but it's, uh, there is one specific, there is one specific uh, tab that is called stay safe, uh, which is very different because it kind of gives you certain, maybe even tips that you should consider for your own security. Uh, you know, we, we rarely really think what's happening and how, where is the cloud or what is that? You know, cloud is just a server. The question is who has access to that server? You know, it's not like it literally sits in the cloud, what some people <laughs> do think, but then- Cloud, you know, cloud the, just means other people's computers. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and we really wanna, you know, especially sourcers, we have to be really careful with our data because 
we work with a lot of our people's data and you don't want that to be leaked anywhere and you have no right to be leaked because you would have a lot of legal issues yeah. so uh have a look because it's it's a really in-depth overview of very useful stuff and i think in the same vein as well uh bellingham is one uh, michael Bessel. um is another one. Uh, he has a podcast. He writes book. Uh, Michael Purcell is a is a former police uh, American police officer uh, who's worked for the FBI. Uh, what he does now is he helps people to disappear. Online. Wait, is is he is he the same guy who said uh, I can bet money that you will never find an image of myself or something? Yes. Yeah, because okay. uh, he's actively go out uh, went out and taking every every reference to him away. Um, he helps celebrities uh, and people who are, they might have a stalker, uh, they might be, you know, have been in an abusive relationship, things like that. He helps them disappear online or be very hard to find. So that is basically his business now. But he does a podcast um, as well, where he talks a lot about the different ways of doing things, gives a lot of free information. He has online training for OSINT and, uh, you know, disappearing online. And he writes books. Uh, so definitely check out him as well. November, uh, I found an article by uh, Irina Shemoyeva uh, about image diversity sourcing with no photos. So, uh, yeah, any, anybody who uh, is in the kind of European school of diversity sourcing, knows that what most of our clients and companies look for is like, we need female developers or female whatever. Uh, and uh, like one of the ways that we've done this in the past is either, Glenn, Kathy was talking about this in an interview I heard as well. It's like, you know, the first name thing is like, you know, you put as many female first names in as you can, can possibly get in a search string. Um, it's a rather biased search because, you know, especially with some of the countries that, that we're in, it's like, just because well, we would have gone and look at the census, it's like, what's the most common female names from people, like from girls who were born, yeah. but that doesn't, there's a lot of people you exclude by that, like immigrants or non-common names and things like that. Uh, but what Irina looked at is that, and you'll see that more and more on social networks, is that uh, women don't put up profile pictures of themselves in a lot of these social networks, especially like developers and things like that, uh, mainly because they're tired of getting um, indecent proposals on social networks. But uh, what a lot of the social networks have done is that they kind of leak your uh, identity in terms of whether you have self-identified as male or female when you signed up for the network with the profile picture that, well, the silhouette picture that they use instead of a profile picture. The avatar. Uh, yeah, yeah, the avatar is either male or female. Um, so you can actually search for this, you know, this placeholder profile picture. Uh, you can search for female avatars. Um, so I think brilliant. I mean, if uh, anybody's not uh, following uh, Boolean Strings, Irina, her research is always spot on. Uh, it would, it just the way that her brain works of thinking Again, thinking of those connections, that's the kind of thing you can expect from when Irina writes articles. Yeah. Uh, a lot of what she does is around, has been around LinkedIn and those connections, like what's, you know, what's underneath the surface of LinkedIn and what you can do with the search. Uh, I remember last year or two years ago when she was starting to kind of look at what if you search for uh, you know, the same thing, you search for university and not university you still get results, you know, what, you know, those kind of things. It's like when you search for and not, but you exclude the same thing you search for, but you still get results. What is those results? So a lot of those kind of things um, is what Irina is, is, is well known for. Uh, this is another one of, of, of brilliant, of just another way of thinking of things and finding people that wouldn't necessarily get found by the traditional ways of us looking for things. Uh, and then we're in uh, December uh, and uh, yeah, one thing that happened in December is that we brought back this show. Um, I've been on, I've been on <laughs> hiatus for, uh, well, I think since May or something like that. Um, basically when lockdown started to come to an end in Spain um, and nothing had happened to the social challenge uh, show, but we decided to bring back, um, yeah, the sourcing challenge with a weekly show and this is it. And I'm extremely happy to be part of it. 
And as you said, like, yeah, it's uh, the, basically the two year anniversary of uh, it, it actually you is being on the show. Because it, it actually is because the, the episode aired on the 30th of December. There you go. So um, I was like, oh my God, that's such a bizarre day. And I was like, is this going to be a very different new year? And that, that's exactly <laughs> how it was. Not the 2020, but that was 2019. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, because. I think that so many people are asking themselves if someone would travel back in time and would tell me before Christmas what to expect from 2020. Everyone was like, not possible. But, <laughs> and I think that, you know, maybe this can be an example that uh, it's the same with 2021. But let's think of it because we already saw so many negative things from 2020 that both unexpectedly it can go in a positive way as well, not just negative. So why don't we try to build that positivity uh, around what we want from the, na- from the new year? Because it's going to be much better. Like, can it be worse than it will it already have? I mean, there's a lot of positive that came out of it for me as well. Like, I, yeah. I now don't have to justify why, we, why, why I work from home anymore. Uh, similar to my wife, it's like a lot of those kind of hurdles for, yes, I can do the work that I do working from home. Uh, no, I don't have to be in the same country as you to do what I do. Um, you know, those discussions are no longer there. And that's definitely helped. Uh, and at the same time, it's like, you know, the, the whole kind of lockdown is like I got to do a lot of the things that I had a lot more time than normally because we just finished a contract and, it, you know, there wasn't much work. Um, so I was doing three shows a week for a couple of months, um, got a lot more content out. Um, but it's also why I've had a break until basically December since then, because it's like you can only do three shows a week for that long. Um, mm-hmm. But I hope that, you know, people who are new to us, uh, definitely, you know, there's 64 episodes of the Sourcing Challenge show that I uh, definitely think you should go back and, and listen to or watch. Uh, and there's more coming. And Dove and I will be back uh, every week with, uh, with new shows as well. So we will. No excuse. Uh, and yeah, once you get into it, definitely there is a, a lot more content as well. Um, what also happened in December, you found an article in uh, Hong's uh, Recruiting Brain Food, uh, which was uh, everything you uh, always wanted to know about GitHub, but were afraid to ask. Oh, yeah. Um, let's have a look at it. Which is, uh, yeah, essentially somebody took the, the whole GitHub archive uh, and there is a lot of data in terms of that. And then just went through one by one. I mean, if, you, if you're a technical recruiter and you thought you knew about GitHub, uh, mm-hmm. this, is, this, is, this is by far uh, the most specific guide about, you know, what is GitHub all about uh, down to the, you know, to the really technical nerdy level. Um, so have a look through that. Uh, but at the same time as well, if you're not already subscribed to, uh, to, to recruiting brain food, I don't know what rock you've been hiding under for the last, what, three, four years. Um, I remember when Hong started this some years ago. Um, and, you know, there was, I think quite was, a few years ago, there, I think there was 15, That's like at least three years ago. On, yeah, it was 1500 people on it when I joined or something like that. And now it's. I think well above 30,000, I think. I think that's exactly around the time when we met because when we met, it was you, Hung, Catherine, and the guy from LinkedIn. Yeah. Uh, So there were five of us in a a pub. Yeah. And and then I think uh, just started the newsletter. It was maybe a few weeks or so. It's like, wow, this guy's doing a newsletter. And like, look where that (laughs) newsletter is right now. It's incredible. Yeah, exactly. I mean, now it's still, it's like, I, I think it's the most important newsletter. It is because it's like it's weekly. It's, you know, every Sunday morning in your mailbox. And it's like there's always something. It's like, you know, for me, it's like it's not always something that's interesting for me from a sourcing point of view, but there's always something for you to read. And that, that was why Hong started as well. It's like there's so much every week to read. You know, you have to be on every Facebook group. You have to, you know, look at your there's always something to read in our community how do you kind of boil that down to what's the most important things and that was what you know brain food was about uh, and now it's much more than that it's the newsletter and then it's uh, you know the the live show every friday um, and hong keeps coming up with new things to to kind of use that content for you know to get people to see it 
uh, and it's brilliant. It's definitely well needed in our community. And then and, and hats off to him for keeping with it because unlike me, who like taking like six months break here and there, he doesn't. Uh, Hong, Hong does not take breaks. It's been every week for, uh, God, even with his uh, podcast as well. It's like the, the one, the last one they did, the live show was number 90. You know, it's just really uh, taken off. And uh, he's prolific about just getting out content every week without fail. Yeah, and and this is something to admire because it's so easy just to, yeah, I'm not doing this week, but then you know, you know, he is incredible at building that following that is there, and and I was really surprised because you know after we were doing the last week's episode, I was like, oh, I haven't I haven't looked into recruiting uh, brain food in a long time because. I was like, okay, am I still sourcing? Am I recruiting? It's like, if it's even needed. And then I was switching emails and I didn't want to get that, that information into that email and I'm unsubscribed, but I forgot to resubscribe. And then a week ago after, I think, uh, when, I, when I was preparing for, the, for our show, uh, I was like, oh, I think it's time for me to resubscribe. And I was so happy to get a new, uh, new, new, like a new email on Sunday. I was like, Oh, now I remember what it feels like. But also, if you missed the last few years, like the, all of the content going back from newsletter number one is online. It's, it's not searchable. like yeah, you missed a index. newsletter, like, you know, tough luck. It's like you can go back and Hong has made it searchable. But go back and read every article um, and has numbers and like, you know, Dom is like us, he loves the data. So it's like, who's reading what and what's the most read? And so the data is all there and you can go back and read the articles from the beginning uh, and every newsletter that come out. So definitely take advantage of that. And all of that, what's on around that, uh, the list of podcasts to listen to, uh, which keeps growing as well. Uh, when we were still doing events, like what events are coming up? There's a list of that that keeps getting curated. Um, Even same thing jobs, with the community. For example, what companies are, uh, are vacancies with companies. Yeah. Have. Well, it's, it's really, um, well, you hear it from the horse's mouth, you know? It's yeah. like, that's the first thing that comes onto you in, in, into your email and it's direct. So, yeah. so definitely. Uh, and I think the last thing we had was um, there's an article, well, there was two articles written by uh, Adrian uh, from Matcher in uh, SourceCon. And it was around, well, based on his talk that he did, uh, I think uh, at both at SourceCon Digital and at uh, Sourcing Summit uh, around using video in, uh, in outreach. And uh, if anybody knows Dov and I, uh, they know that it's not exactly new for us because we spoke about this when we met for the first time in 2017. Um, I, I remember when uh, when when you were uh, introducing me to Bomb Bomb and 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 it was not Loom. It was something some, via 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 VDR, VDR. VDR. Yeah. And and I remember you were like, "Hey, Dov, you need to try. I got this from marketing and this and that." And it's like, and I remember I recorded ten videos, which were awful. It took me ages. I was still working with Andy. Uh, I, I, it was so painful. And I remember you were giving these tips of like holding the paper with their name and or being behind a blackboard with their name and stuff like that. And I, I never experienced like I, I didn't explore, but I know that, you know, when you were working on your jobs, when you were going for like thousands of developers, like there was a massive project that you were working on yeah. that you were actually going using that. I'm doing it. My wife is doing it. Like, you yeah. know, we all, we all have different ways of doing things. So like my, my wife has taken on to it now. Like she will not, whenever she oh, yes, I've it, seen some of her videos that she sent to me. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, when, 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 you know, when she starts a new role, she will shoot a video. So yes, she's not doing a video for, for every candidate, but she'll doing one for the, again, just to like, and as part of why we, I started doing videos, it's just getting that because the, the point of the outreach is to get that person to talk to you. If you can seem more human, be more human in that outreach, then that's going to be a smaller step for them to set up a call with you. Yeah. Um, so the way that we, uh, especially the way that my wife uses video is that like, this is me, you know, this is what we're getting, getting a lot of the information you would normally put in an email, putting that in a video and putting it in the email. 
Um, so, so yeah, she won't start a new role uh, without shooting a video specifically for that role that she can send to potential candidates and then either share on LinkedIn directly with, you know, direct messages or put in an email and send to them. So I spoke about this for the first time at Sosu in Amsterdam in 2017. Oh, that's the year that I skipped. And mm. I spoke again about it at uh, SourceCon in Budapest in 2018. So this is, but for me, it's nothing new. Uh, but back then it's like, ah, it's difficult. Nobody's going to do it. Um, like I've gotten a few people converted. Now you start, like you have Adrian talking about it both at you know, Source Conver SourceCon Digital and at, um, at Sosu uh, V. Um, you got, I saw uh, another at the German uh, Sourcing Summit was talking about it. And, and I love that that's finally there, but it's kind of partly what comes back to I, uh, conference overload that we talked about last, uh, last week is that one of the things that I don't like about all of these conferences is that a lot of people, what they forget is where the idea came from. Um, and I, what I see at a lot of conferences is a lot of people not giving credit to where they got the original ideas from. Uh, Jan Texer is uh, one of the ones that suffer the most for this as well. Like if you start, like he does a lot of search for his own articles and will find them on companies' websites as their own that they use for content like yeah. recruitment com companies using it as content where it's like, it's not like, it's not like they rewritten it and they borrowed idea. They will take his article they just word copy for paste word it. and yeah. just put it out. They will put it on their LinkedIn as their own. They will put it on their blog section of the companies uh, like to the point where he's had to threaten with legal action for a lot of these companies because it's like, that's his intellectual property. Um, and it's one of the reasons why, like from the beginning that I started doing YouTube, I started doing video and audio uh, because I know that it's much harder to copy what we do when it's audio and video. Because guess what? Like people are not going to, you know, post this and say it's themselves because they don't look like us. Um, and it and takes they, shitloads of time to transcribe. If they want to go, if they want to go and do the transcript, I, I, you know, I, I have it. You know, there's one time when I was doing it, and you, that was your. You your, you your did that with my interview with so with the amazing oh hiring God. exactly amazing like hiring, yeah. that one hour interview. You turned that into three articles. It's like, look, if you want to go and do that, be my guest. It's I a mean, lot of time. Though. Yeah, it yeah. is. I like, I try to, I try to do that myself. So definitely, um, but when you write articles, it's much it's much easier just to like you just yeah. take the name off and you post it. Um, but what you forget is that people like Jan, um, when like all of the conference speakers, when we come up with original material, we're not doing it to get paid for it. We don't get paid for it. But when we write articles, when we do original material and you use that, then at least give us credit. Like, like I speak at conferences, I do training for free so that you can go and you know, subscribe to the show or you can go and sign up to the paid training that I do and things like that. But if you use my intellectual property and don't reference me, I'll never get that. Um, so yeah, it's like, I love that ideas that, you know, we're sharing that they start actually, you know, getting out. Uh, going back to Glenn Cathy as well, it's like, I think when you go back and you read Glenn Cathy's article, like, most of what he wrote 10 years ago is like people now talk about is as if it's like they just reinvented the wheel. It's like, it's not new ideas. It's just a lot of us are realizing 10 years later that it exists, um, yeah. you know, and we keep reinventing the wheel. But yeah, there's a lot of articles coming out now, especially in the last year that I'm like, hold on, I've seen that before, but not by this person. And, uh, I would, and I, I spoke, episode number one of the Sourcing Challenge show with Trish Revel. One of the points at the end of the show, what we talk about is exactly this, because already there, Jan was talking about his articles getting stolen. And we were talking about like, what, what can we do to get people to kind of reference where they got the information from? Because Trish was the same. He was writing a lot of articles and people were stealing the content. Um, 
you know, that's what's when, when, I, when, when I started two and a half years ago with the show, it's like exactly that. So it's like, this is new, but it's just, we've seen it more and more now, especially now where everybody's working from home and there's nobody going out and creating a lot of new content in terms of shooting things. Like they're looking other places in the internet and finding things that normally it's, you use that as a, you should use it as an idea generation tool, but what we see more and more, yeah. it should be inspiration. That's what we all do is like, I see some, you know, I heard about using video in, in outreach on a podcast. Um, and I have like, when I did the talks, I re referenced where I got the idea from. Um, and that's what it should be. But like, uh, you know, Ivina is one of the ones as well. It's like, that should get referenced much more than she does because she comes up with a lot of original ideas. Um, so yeah. like if you're writing articles, if you're doing conference talks and you do borrow heavily from other people, then just give us credit, like give people credit. And if, you know, if you don't remember, then maybe put it out there to the community. It's like, I know I heard this somewhere. Does anybody remember where it was from? So I can reference that in my talk or in my, in my article. Exactly. And, you know, and for me, where, when I started going to SOSUS um, and especially last year, I think I went to quite a few, <laughs> um, including Israel. I think that was like at least three. Um, but the beauty is that when you're attending the live events and you have the live engagement in the audience, um, I remember there was one speaker, I don't remember the, the person, uh, but um, there was a question from the audience, more like a challenging one. And it's like, oh, I really liked your idea that you mentioned in this and that. And there was a comment and the person said, well, you know, I can't take the credit for the idea because it's actually, I don't know, was it Marcel or was it Jan who were, you know, said like, this is the person who came up with the idea. You know, I just kind of adjusted to it. You know, everything, the way I see it, right? So that because there's a lot of content out there that is free, uh, I look at it as open source. Yeah. You can take it, you can turn it into something else. But, you know, if you are using an in-mail script that Shamila shared with you, like in her post, you cannot say, hey, this is my script because, well, this is, you know, you can take that and you can adjust it. But even if you are going to be sharing it, you will not be able to say, hey, this is actually only originally me. I think that maybe the challenge here comes down to... Um, this is not related to sourcing, but this is uh, related to, I mean, I'm obsessed with TED Talks. And, uh, <laughs> and Elizabeth Gilbert, she is a, a writer famously known for Eat, Pray, Love. Um, I didn't read that book and I discovered the TED Talk because it's one of the most viewed TED Talks. And I was like, oh, okay, interesting. And she actually talked about the fact that, uh, about creativity and where, uh, and she dived into uh, the, um, you know, the ancient um, uh, Greece and ancient Rome and, and stuff like that. And, and to understand how creativity was understood. And back then, people saw that if you are creative in, and you could be a writer, a painter, a singer, it doesn't matter, any creative person, that you would have a daemon working with you. Is that, that imag imaginary fairy, uh, you know, kind of spirit? Your muse, um, yeah. You muse, yeah. So if you came up with a really incredible, let's say, uh, poem, well, you were lucky because a very incredibly creative muse was assigned to you. If the your cre creative, you know, outcome is flopping, that means that well, maybe the like that entity was just uh, lazy. You know, but then when the Renaissance came, they removed that, you know, understanding of a person having a genius instead of they turn into themselves being a genius. And, and you know, I think this can potentially be, uh, you know, like we can take this for anything. You know, um, whenever we come up with an idea, is it really our idea? what influenced the idea and and then what i would recommend uh, that elizabeth gilbert actually wrote an incredible book big magic mm -hmm. where she talks about the creativity and about ideas and she had this incredible concept that every idea that we receive 
it's like a, a soul that is looking for a body. You know, like before the, before the, the child is born, the soul kind of has to connect and, you know, way before the child is born, right? So it's a similar concept, but we, when we write down a, an incredible idea for a book, for a movie, for a TV show, for a song, for anything, if we don't do anything about it, that idea will, it is dying. And for, for the idea to be alive, it will have to travel and find another source or uh, channel that potentially could realize it, you know? So this is the reason as well why you have cases when two people would come up with exactly the same thing and they never heard of it uh, or one another or it's impossible for them to copy it, but it's identical. So, you know, sometimes when we think that we came up with an idea that is original, now with Google, it's really easy. Just check, <laughs> right? Because I'm sure that people who are writing, you know, they don't necessarily have anything they're not doing it maybe on purpose, you know, they sometimes it's just because of, as you said, like they might be new in the industry and you're not aware of, it's the same in music. Uh, someone hears a new song, which is a, a, a biggest hit. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry, this is this track from the eighties. This is from the nineties. And that sample is from there. And that sample is from there. We recycle things. This is yeah. how our brain works. No, especially but, in our community where we share so openly what we do. Yeah. And, you know, it's all about, because there is no secret sauce for what, what we do. But a lot of it is like, we don't have big egos to the most extent, but everybody likes recognition. So, you know, if you're, if you're sharing things that you know kind of where you got the ideas from, like share that, definitely. What a year it's been, yeah? <laughs> definitely. Look, uh, this is definitely one of the longer shows. Uh, we're not going to go this long every week, uh, but we will be back every week. Uh, if you enjoyed this show, definitely, uh, you know, give us a like, give us a review. Um, but most importantly, share this with somebody that you think should listen to us as well. Um, as I said, there's 64 episodes of the Sourcing Challenge show. Uh, a lot of the people that we do talk about, we've already had on um, and, and, you know, gotten their backstory. So if you want to learn from a lot of the people that, that I've learned from, uh, go back and listen to that. Um, Dov and I are going to be back. Uh, next year, uh, we have a whole a year of uh, talking about new things every, every week. Uh, but at the same time, we have a lot of ideas of the things that we think is missing in this community that we want to bring as well. Um, so and I if, I, if I can add uh, one thing. So whenever you are finding information online that you think is really interesting, do ping us a message because... Uh, the idea is to look into the content that is relevant, most relevant for the community. And, uh, you know, we're all sourcers. We sometimes find diamonds where we least expect. But, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily going to end up somewhere on a big blog or on a big newsletter. But we would be more than happy to talk about it if it's really something, you know, original. Because original ideas happen all the time as well. So, Absolutely. And Dov, uh, where can people find you if they want to see more and no more who oh, it depends on what part of me you want to see that's the <laughs> the biggest challenge uh i would say that instagram for dov zavado is where i'm not necessarily alive but if you're into music indie top 39 is where i share music and this is my this is my baby right now uh linkedin is for more kind of official professional stuff um i don't necessarily tend to connect with people randomly on Facebook if I haven't met them. Uh, but anyway, just send me a message. Um, if you want to send me an email, it's sourcewithdov at gmail.com. Super easy. And yeah, I think that would be for me. What about you? What's oh, the best me? thing you? Yeah, other than doing my day job, uh, as I, I've mentioned that a couple of times, but I am working on uh, training in February with uh, Kim and Gordon Lokenberg and uh, Aaron Lintz. Uh, you can find out more about that on uh, sourcingskills.com. Um, other than you that, you don't want to yeah. miss that training. <laughs> These are uh, because, you know, I can say that because I'm not biased here, because I've been getting training from all of you guys throughout the year. And I don't know where, uh, where I would be if it wasn't for that, because it's not just for the training that is put up as a training material, but it's just 
uh, you know, it's just the information that you can get at a cup of, you know, while drinking a coffee or beer or whatever. So definitely it's a really powerhouse. Uh, I, I, you know, it's, yeah. I mean, I'm, I know I'm going to be there anyway. So uh, exactly. No, yeah. and it's, it's, it's like, for me, it's like a family reunion. Um, one is the training, two is the, the direct access to all four of us in terms of actually, you know, answering questions, giving you help, just getting you to think differently about sourcing, whether that's on a kind of basic sourcing level or advanced training. So yeah, check it out on sourcingskills.com. Uh, other than that, yeah, there's definitely more things that we're working on. Uh, as I said last week, I have new episodes coming to the Sourcing Challenge show as well. Um, there is episodes already recorded that I just have to get around to actually edit and getting out there. Um, so I'm hoping to get back into a weekly release schedule as well so that we can talk about the new episodes of the interview show on our yeah. weekly show as well. So, uh, yeah, other than that, we'll be back next year, which is next week. Um, but for all of that, it's been really cool, uh, as always, hanging out with you, Dov. Uh, thank it's you for always that. a pleasure. <laughs> And as I said, uh, if you as the, the viewer or listener think that this is somebody, uh, this is something that your friend or your colleague or your whole team should, uh, should listen to, please share this show with them and uh, make sure to subscribe, whether that's on YouTube or on your uh, favorite podcast player or Spotify. See you next year. Happy See New Year. See you next year. <laughs> Bye.